Jesus' last mile is what we're talking about today. John 16, verse number seven, read it together. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The last mile indicates the last leg of a journey. When you're in the final stages of anything, the last mile is also what a convicted criminal would be going as they leave from their jail cell to their place of execution. The last mile. For those who run track know that the last mile is the most difficult when you're in a distance run. Many people get that close. They're into the arena. They ran 25 miles and they're on that last mile and many people break down in that last mile. And you feel like giving up. It was in scripture when King Zerubbabel had to do a task and he had ran out of all resources and it looked like the task was about to be called to a halt. But then God said a word to the king because the king had ran out of his resources. Because you run out of your resources doesn't mean that God has run out of his resources. Is that right? Because your strength is not there doesn't mean that God doesn't give you new strength. So what Zerubbabel was reminding him that you're going to complete this task. But it will not be by power nor by might but by my spirit says the Lord. Amen. That's how we are completed. There's a church in Hawaii called the Miracle Church. I've shared this before. The Miracle Church where the islanders were going to build a church completely out of coral. They had gathered what they thought was sufficient amount to complete the project. But after beginning the project, they didn't have enough. And they were going to have to stop the construction. But then a miracle happened. A storm came. Now the only place you can get coral is deep down in the ocean floor. And the storm swept an enormous amount of coral up on the shore. It was a sufficient amount of coral for them to complete the project. And then another miracle happened, another storm. And it washed the remaining coral that was left back into the ocean. Look it up. It's a beautiful church in Hawaii called the Miracle Church. That reminds us storms oftentimes brings us to completion. Sometimes you're broken down before God will build you up. A storm is your defining moment, your turning point, your last mile when you feel like you have nothing left and then a storm comes. You say, God, I, I don't have anywhere else to go. That's when you cry out to him. In the midst of your storm, God takes those broken pieces and God begins to rebuild you as a real true member of his church. You thought you knew Jesus before the storm. But after your storm, can anybody testify that you really got to know him after your storm? After you've been through what you've been through, now you understand what it means to, when you sing the songs of Zion, you know what it means to raise your hand and give God glory and to give God praise, to be unapologetic about your worship because you've been through the storm. I think everybody can testify that they've either gone through storms or Maybe you're in a storm right now. And maybe you're on that last mile and you're wondering, where, where do you go from here? And that's what Jesus faced. He went through everything that we could ever encounter when he was down here. Because he wanted to show us how to do it. When you want to know how do you do it, how do you make it through, you, you look to Jesus. Look to what he did. Look at how Jesus made it through his storms. In Isaiah chapter 40, I'm just going to share this verse with you, verse number 31. It says, those who wait upon the Lord, you shall mount up with wings as an eagle. He says, he'll renew your strength. If you wait, if you're patient, it's not your strength anymore. Your strength is gone. What you receive is his strength. And he says, he'll renew your strength. He says, you will mount up with wings like what? An eagle. An eagle. You will run and you'll not get weary anymore. And you will walk and you'll not fight anymore. Why? Because he has stepped in and given you his, his strength. God likens us oftentimes to eagles. And Satan 
is likened oftentimes to a serpent or a snake. Let me tell you something. An eagle is a snake's worst nightmare. Yeah. Just you, an eagle is a serpent's, a snake's worst nightmare. Because what an eagle does, when an eagle encounters a snake, the first thing an eagle does is he grabs the snake and he takes him up high. He won't fight the snake on the ground. No, he takes the snake up into the air. He changes the battleground. Because up there, the snake is totally disoriented. He's lost his strength, he's lost his stamina, and he has no power. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Satan always wants to bring you down to his level. No, don't do that. Don't fight the devil on his ground. Take it up to the glory. Take your problems up high. He has no power, no authority over you. Take your issues up to Jesus. We always want to get down here and wallow and whine and complain down here. And Jesus says, come up to me. Come unto me. If you're weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Rise up above this situation. We've got to be able to rise up. I told you, when you fly out from here and, you, and there's a storm down here in the valley, have you noticed that when you fly out and you, and you try to take off and you look down, what happened? You get above your storm. You look down, you see where your storm was. There's a way that you can rise above your storm. And Jesus is always telling us, take it to me in prayer. Rise up above your situation. Don't stay down here and wallow in it. Start praising. Start lifting up glory. Start giving God the honor that he so deserves. And before you know it, he starts renewing your strength. Yes. You were worried, but now he's giving you peace. Nothing has changed, but the peace comes. Yes. That's what we want. We want the peace of God. Not the P-I-E-C-E, -E, but the P-E-A-C-E -E of God. Is that right? Because the world, the world just wants a peace. I just want enough God to get rid of my situation. No, he wants to give you the P-E-A-C-E. -E, not part of God. Not a piece of the rock. The whole rock. Yes. That's what Jesus is. The whole rock. On Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other ground is what? Sinking sand. Give God a round of praise. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus' last mile, the first thing Jesus did was he faced the challenge, faced the challenge. And I want you to know, be encouraged. Your challenge is not bigger than you. You got to face it sometimes. I don't know if you ever faced a bully. If you haven't, this, you'll find that once you face a bully, the victory is in facing him. It's not in the outcome. You may get beat down, but the point is you'll never lose another battle like that again. It's in facing it. Face your challenges. Jesus predicted his death three times. In Luke chapter 9, verse 22, three times Jesus predicted his death. He told his disciples, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. You notice that Jesus talked about his crucifixion, but he also talked about his resurrection. Yeah. Remember, when you're going through things, there's always a resurrection. Don't think that it's always, it don't end there. There's always glory after the persecution. God don't leave you there. There's always something good that's coming from this. The Bible says that all things work together for your good. When you say all things, what does that eliminate? Nothing, right? That means that whatever you can encounter, you got to believe, I don't know how. I don't know how this is going to work. But you got to believe that this is working. And it's, just, and it's working for my good. So you got to have that attitude of gratitude. God, I, I know that this is not a pleasant situation. It's not something that I choose. But I know, God, that you chose me for the task. And if you chose me for this, that means you're going to bless me through it. There's a blessing in your storm. There's a blessing in your storm. you got to believe it. God don't leave you there. We tend to leave him in the place where we need him the most. People will abandon God when they're going through the most critical times of their lives because they're not feeling and seeing what they think they should see. Yes. It's not happening in their time frame. So, so we abandon God. No, do not become weary. God is not done with us yet. Do you know God's not done with you yet? Aren't you glad he's not done with you yet? That he won't leave you like you are? That you are, we are a work in progress. God is still working on us. You just got to avail yourself to him and let him complete the work that he is doing. And the work is good. A new you. 
And God has prepared so much for the new you. That's why he wants new things for a new you. Because if God gave new things to the old you, you would do what you did with everything else you've gotten. I know some of you probably broke your toys the first day you got them. Everybody broke their toys the first day? And if that's your nature, then we've got to learn how to be better caregivers and caretakers, better managers of what God gives us. Because what God gives us now is just a preview of what he has in store. He didn't stop now. There's so much more that's in store for us. The disciples were saying, Jesus, you can't go. You can't go. We, 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 don't, we don't want to go. I can't. Don't, don't leave now. But Jesus knew that he had to leave. He had to leave. We have loved ones who've, who've lived their life and, and they'll recognize sometimes that it's time to go. Sometimes there's an old generation that say, okay, it's time for me to go home. No, Grandma, you're not going to go. No, shut up. It's time for me to go see Jesus. It's time for me to go. So get everybody together. If they want to see me, get everybody together. It's time for me to go. Because they know that they've finished their work. They've seen their children. They've seen their grandchildren. And God has been good to them. There's a point where we, where we know our end basket is empty. It's time. We're done. We're finished. We're ready to move on and see Jesus. But we face every challenge. We've faced everything that God has brought us. And we brought him glory through everything. And Jesus knew that. In John chapter 16, verse number 7, uh, Jesus told them, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Who's that helper he's talking about? The Holy Spirit. While Jesus was here and all the miracles that Jesus did and all the things that Jesus was able to accomplish, he says, and greater things than these you would be able to do. But Jesus could only be at one place at one time. But when he sends the helper, the Holy Spirit, now Jesus can be every place because he dwells in us. And the works that Jesus did, we should be able to do. We should be able to lay hands on people and, and, and they shall recover. We should be able to do the things that he says and greater things than these you should be able to do. The Holy Spirit is God's power in us. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in every one of us. Every one of us. He says, I will not leave you alone. I'm not leaving you by, by yourself. I will send a helper and he will leave you and make you better. Jesus faced the challenges. And we're going to face challenges. We're going to make it through it. I think Sam was saying, if God brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. Amen. If you're allowed to come to something, you're able to go through it. The next thing he did was he endured the pain. Nobody likes this part. Nobody likes to endure any kind of pain, hardship, and suffering. We don't want to go through this. If it's going to be painful, I don't want it. Sometimes you just got to Go through that. No pain, no gain. It sounds good. We get the A on paper, except when we start enduring the pain. As soon as the pain comes, oh, Lord Jesus, oh. Don't like pain. Especially if it's chest pain, right? Chest pain to make an atheist pray. John 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled. This is Jesus speaking. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Don't pray to God to take you away from the thing that God brought you to. Some things he brings you to to prove you. If you didn't know that you could do it, if you didn't know that you had the power, if you didn't know that God was with you, how would you ever know unless you did it through a challenge? You don't know what you're capable of until you're tested. And when you're tested, you're thinking, I didn't know I could do that. Your life should be a witness where you're looking back and every few years you should look back and say, I didn't know I could do that. You're constantly going through changes and, and you're growing and, and you're making improvements because you didn't know that you could do that. But the reason that you can do that is you start giving more and more of yourself over to him. And the more you give to him, the more he starts bringing out in you things you never thought were possible. That's not possible with you. But with God, 
how many things are possible. All things are possible. And he wants to do the impossible with you. I didn't know I could do that. No, you couldn't. You couldn't. But when God gets hold of you, oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Jesus also had to endure the pain the same night of denial and betrayal of two of his disciples. Peter, who says, Jesus, I will never deny you. He says, that before the rooster crows, you're not going to deny me one time, but you're going to deny me three times. And Peter goes, no, Jesus, Jesus, that's these other jokers maybe, but Jesus, this is Peter. Yeah. Yes, Peter. Yes. Betrayed the same night when Jesus needed him most. And as he was being betrayed by the other disciple who's going and says, how much will you give me if I turn him over to you? See, when you're going through your last mile and you're calling on your help, and don't be surprised if your help don't show up. When your friends forsake you and the people that you thought would be there for you, don't, don't be surprised if sometimes they're, they're not there for you. That's when you got to put your hands in God's hands. And know that you're never alone. Sometimes the most alone time you've probably ever experienced is when you've been in a room, a room full of people. And then there's times when you've been by yourself in God's presence and you felt that you were never alone. Wherever you go, he's with you. Amen. He says that he will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. Many times the leaving and forsaking is our part, our doing. When we get out there, you start crying out to God, wondering where is God? God says, yes, where are you? I'm in the same place I was when I saw you last. Go back to where I saw you last. That's where you'll find me. He didn't stray. We tend to stray. I told you, Kim and I have an agreement. If we're ever someplace and we get parted, I don't know where she is. She don't know where I am. We don't have our cell phones, because now we have cell phones. What we do is we go back to the last place we were when I saw her, and I just wait. Just wait. If you just wait, go back to the last place you were when you felt his presence. You know, things were okay at some point. Then there was a defining moment, a turning point, where things began to shift. And you don't feel his presence anymore. What were you doing? Go back to that place. I think Andre Crouch had a song that says, take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. You got to ask God, take me back to that place where I first believed. That's where we'll find him. There's a point when everything was going well and when you were in touch and in tune, you could hear God's voice, but then the voice became less and less because you began to distance yourself away from him. Got so many things going on. I get calls every once in a while from people that I haven't seen for a while. Pastor, just checking on you. Yeah, good, how you doing? Good. Yeah, I'm gonna be in church, I've just been so busy. You've been so busy, so many things are going on. I remember when nothing was going on. Now we've got stuff that's going on. When you're too busy to spend time with God, you're too busy. You need to make room. You need to make room. You know, God doesn't scream for your attention. He doesn't send you a notice saying, yes, three Sundays you missed already. Hey, I haven't been hearing you praying lately. I haven't seen you open that Bible. Come on, let's go. So we feel sometimes because we're doing well and when things are going well and, and you know, you, the job is good and the, the money is good and, and you know, family's okay and you're, you're feeling good, you know, so I, I don't, I'm good right now. In other words, you start believing that you're self-sufficient, but had it not been for God on your side, where would you be? When you drive around, you see people out there and they're stranded and you, you look on the news and you see situations happening, thank God that he's got that hedge around you. Because if it had not been for the grace of God, it could be you, your brother, your friend, your neighbor, your parent. It could be you. Luke 22 and verse number 42. This is Jesus' plea as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was about to, to be turned over. 
I said, Father, if, if it is your will, take this cup from me. And then he thought about it, but not my will, but let your will be done. It takes a lot that when you're going through things to believe that God has a will still in your life. And sometimes God's will is that you go through this thing. And you got to pray, God, I would love, take this away, take God, take this away from me right now. God, please take this away. You're praying and believing. But then you have to say, but God, but not my will. But let your will be done. Because God has a plan for you. His plans for you is good, isn't it? And not evil. Sometimes we don't hear God until we get to that point where we can only look up. I think Verizon had this commercial, Verizon Wireless, where the guy would go around the world and he would say, can you hear me now? Good. Trying to prove how well the reception is and how well far reaching they are with this service. Sometimes we get to where God's distant and we've strayed from him and God says, can you hear me now? Because we can't hear God sometimes when things are going so well. He finished strong, Jesus finished strong. John 18, verse number four, verse number six, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, this is when they came to Jesus. They came to him and they brought all this, these guys with swords and spears and weapons and they're about to take Jesus, about to take him to the judgment hall. So they're about to encounter Jesus and Jesus comes to them and Jesus says, whom are you seeking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas who betrayed him also stood with them. Now here's the power. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. That's power, isn't it? You don't have to worry about your enemies. There's power, there's power and authority over them. Even in all of this, Jesus' power, all he says is, I am he, I'm he, and then boom, they just fell down. They didn't have authority. But Jesus knew that prophecy had to be fulfilled. Yes. That he had to go through what he had to go through so that you and I could receive what God's gift he had for us. But he went through it for us. Yes. Not for himself. Because he could have called on the legions of angels. He had power and authority over all of that. But he went through that for you and for me. Jesus. It's personal. And we come next week and we share the resurrection. We're going to hear the rest of the story. We're going to hear about the judgment hall and what he had to go through and how he proved his love for you and for me. The value that you have is not on what someone else says. The value that comes to you that you really are is the price that was paid for you. Amen. And you and I were bought at a great price. The blood of Jesus. That's the price. If you had a price tag and someone could see your value, it would say blood of Jesus. That's the price that was paid. When he got to the end of this, as Paul would finish his epitaph, he says, I fought a good fight. Oh, what, what, don't, you, don't you want to be able to say that? When it's finally done, when it's no more Sundays, and you're ready to meet your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you want to be able to say, it was a good fight. Doesn't mean you want them all. Sometimes just finishing the fight is worth it. Just staying the course. Because the option is to want to give up on God, to want to stop. Don't become weary when things are going well. Things may not be going as well as you want to. Doesn't mean that you're not in a perfect plan in a perfect place with Jesus. Don't judge where you are based upon your view of it. Finish your course. Paul says, I fought a good fight. He says, I, I kept my faith. Kept my faith. Keep believing. 
Don't stop. Don't give up on God. He never gave up on us. He never will ever leave us. He'll never forsake us. You're his. And next week as we share, we'll share as I'll share when Jesus was on that cross. He looked beyond the suffering. He looked beyond the pain. He saw me. You got to believe it's personal. He saw you. Your name was written. And he died so that you and I would live. And because he died for you, we live for him. That's why we live. I don't live for me. At some point, you stop living for you. You start living for him. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. The world gets to know him through you. Sometimes through your suffering, people get to know Jesus as you suffer. Barb and I were talking about that this morning. Barb, I want to just share a little bit of what we're talking about. Is it okay? When Brad died, devastated all of us, her husband Brad, and everybody was wondering how's Barb, we gotta check on Barb, we gotta see how Barb is doing. It was a Saturday night when Brad died, so it was church on Sunday morning, I made, gonna make the announcement so everybody would know that Brad had just passed, and that we gotta keep Barb in our prayers. But we didn't have to do that because Barb was there. She was there. She had every reason not to be there. She didn't have, no, everybody understood, you know, your husband just passed and I understand that you're grief stricken and, and we'd understand sometimes it takes time to go through the, before we see you again. But she said, no, I had to be here. That's a witness. When it was most difficult time to pray and to believe and to stand up, that's when we had to stand up for Jesus. It was still painful, yes, one of the most difficult, and she said the most difficult thing you could ever go through, but she stood up. All you're doing as believers, we're just standing up when we should stand. When everything around you could tell you to, 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 to just to fold, or to give up, to give in, to give out, no, this is the time when we stand. This is, this is when we show our strength. Our greatest impact on the world is when we're least like the world. We ambassadors, not living for us, living for him. Give God a round of praise. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that your word has been a blessing. If you never accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, if, you, if you're hearing me right now and you've you never prayed that prayer of salvation, I'm going to give you some words right now. Just repeat the words I give you and believe them with all of your heart. If you never accepted Jesus, just say, Father, forgive me. I thank you for never leaving me. I thank you for always being there. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and that God raised him from the dead. By this confession, I'm saved. I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. You may be a backslider. You may have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you need to rededicate your life to him. You need to recommit your ways. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for using me. Thank you for always being there. That when I strayed, you stayed. Take out this heart of stone. Give me a heart of flesh use me mold me to what you would have me to be I make Jesus my Lord and my Savior and Father for those who pray those prayers I pray that your angels right now will encamp around them that would comfort them that would heal them that they would dry the tear stained eye that wounds will be healed that reconciliation revival happens right now where it is needed and God we give you the praise for it because you're so deserving you're so good you're so worthy you're so God thank you thank you for what you're doing thank you for what you've already done for what is past present and future God we give you glory